you want to grab your note cards out, we're going to have a great time together this morning. I cannot wait for today's message. We are starting a brand new collection of talks called Rush, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, hey, you look great today. Tell them you look great today. But also tell them it's time to slow down. Turn to the person next to you and tell them it's time to slow down, right? It's time to slow down. <laughs> I have, become, I have become that dad in my neighborhood. I have a three-year-old son now. He loves to play outside in the front yard. And any, I mean, we live in a neighborhood. Anytime there is some dude that's speeding past our house, I've become the dad that's like, it's a neighborhood. That kid's out here, all right? And if they stop, that's okay. Come get some, all right? Like, you need, to, you need to slow down in my neighborhood. My son's trying to play outside, all right? It's funny, like, uh, that was my mom when I was growing up. Oh, man, she, she didn't care who it was. Even if it was a cop, she'd be like, slow down, all right? You're supposed to protect us here, right? But the thing is, when we get in a hurry, we begin to move too fast. We can not only hurt ourselves, we can hurt those around us. And what I want to talk about today is slowing down. What I want to talk about today is being at peace in our life. We are really living this out as a church because it was gung-ho to get Easter going, Right? It was, let's go, let's go, let's go. And now, it's amazing. We celebrate what God did. And it's now time to take a deep breath, slow down, not be in a hurry, and to see what God is doing in our lives, see what God is doing in our church. Would you write down the title of today's message? Too Fast, Too Furious. Now, these are more than just movies with The Rock and Vin Diesel in them. Uh, these are actually a statement today that I think is really important for us to lean into. That sometimes we can be moving so fast that it's too fast. And it could lead, to, it can lead in our life to a level of being angry and even furious that it's not good for us. Because we're moving too fast. And now we're too furious in our life about all the things that are going on. Really, the goal of this collection of talks over the next few weeks is the next line I want you to write down. The next thing I want you to write down in your notes is this. It says that we are learning how to stay emotionally healthy and spiritually alive in the chaos of the modern world. We're learning how to stay emotionally healthy and spiritually alive in the chaos of the modern world. I don't know about you, but I need some emotional health in my life. I don't need, I don't need to know more things. We live in like the information age, right? It's so easy to know things. Isn't it interesting though that we have more information at our hands and in our pockets than ever before, but we're the most emotionally unhealthy and spiritually dead that we've ever been. Why? Because it's not about knowing things. It's about experiencing things in our life and having an emotional health that gets us through problems and situations and difficulties of life. It's about being spiritually alive, to knowing that maybe we may look vibrant on the outside, but on the inside, woo, we're struggling. It's time to slow down and get healthy. It's time to slow down and involve God again back into our life and say, you know what? I'm working myself to death. And I'm accomplishing a lot. But on the inside, whew, it's rough. And today we're going to slow down and we're going to rest. What we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to go through this book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. We're going to go through God's Word, but also this book. And I read this book a little while ago, and it changed my whole perspective on life and really how to lean in slowing down. And I wanted to continue the generosity today by blessing you with this book today. Generosity is our privilege at our church, so I wanted to give you, gift you this book today. Someone here, uh, not everybody, but just one of you uh, today. So if you'll do me a favor, look under your seats. There's something under there uh, that it, on your special chair that... Uh, I'm just kidding. There's nothing there, man. There's nothing there. <laughs> yes. I, I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to do that, man. Just, I like, I, I was, I wanted to like, just really make it. See, everyone's right. Oh, there, oh, I can win something. Now I'm paying attention, right? Ah, gotcha. But I do want to celebrate someone I want. I do want to give it away because I'm not that much of a Grinch. Uh, but how many, uh, so, I mean, I, I got to celebrate the great people in here. Anyone, April birthdays in here? Any April birthdays? Oh, okay. We got a couple. When's your birthday, sir? April 20th. Oh, man. All right. So you're, we already passed someone's birthday. So you're the one next coming up. So come on. I'll get this book for you, sir. It's here right here. Yes. Yes. There you go. Read it, man. You got like three kids. That's going to be a good book for you to, to, slow, to slow down. And all right, But happy birthday, man, because April's are the best birthdays because our birthstone is the diamond. Come on, everybody. It means we're the best. 
Let's read this verse together. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. It says this, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Would you underline the opening phrase, come to me? And then underline, and I will give you rest. See, some of us in here, we might be weary. We might be burdened. Weary by the stage of life we're in, burdened by what we have to do right now. Can I encourage you in this moment and over the next few minutes as we talk today, you can come to Jesus and the promise is he will give you rest. He doesn't say, come to me and I'll give you stuff to do. He doesn't say, come to me and I'll tell you all the wrong things you're doing. Come to me and I'll give you a religion. I'll give you a framework. I'll give you a self-help. He just says, come to me. Come to me and I will give you rest. If that's something that Jesus is offering, I need it today and I want it today. What we're going to really talk about is the tagline of that book, and I want you to write this down. It's the idea, because Jesus knew this, is that hurry is the greatest enemy to your spiritual life. See, if our spiritual life is out of rhythm, if our spiritual life is messed up, nothing else is going to feel healthy. Everything else is going to feel a little bit chaotic, because it's our spirit that guides everything. That's where, that's where everything started. Everything started with God breathing life into our spirit when we were just dust of the earth so many years ago when he created everything that we see. And hurry is the greatest enemy because hurry causes you to miss things. Hurry causes you to get moving too fast. Hurry breeds anger, stress, all the above, right? Like today I'm wearing glasses that Adrian got me for my birthday because I had a pair just like these that I lost. Here's how I lost them. Shepherd goes to a camp three days a week, and I'll be honest, most of the time we're running late to that camp, usually my fault. Uh, but sometimes, <laughs> you heard my wife say, yep, as soon as I said that. Um, but sometimes it's not only my fault. Sometimes it's little shepherds too, as much as we love him, as cute as he is. He's three now, and something happens when you like turn two and a half that you just, kids hate putting on their shoes. Like, I don't know what it is. We just can't get shoes on this guy. Like, we had to give up on socks a long time ago because that would just add an hour to try and get out of the house. So I'm chasing him down barefoot. He's just stomping all over the ground. I'm like, Shepard, we got to get your shoes on so we can go, buddy. And he knows he's, he just runs away. He's doing this really interesting thing right now where he has like this evil, maniacal laugh that he does when he knows he's done something wrong. Like, I'll go, Shepard, it's time to put your shoes on, buddy, and he'll run away like this, and then I'll go, <laughs> and I'm like, Lord, please, touch him, whatever that is. Like, don't want any of that in my house. Um, but I'm, <laughs> but what happened that day was, finally got his shoes on, we get out, and he always likes to knock my glasses off, and so I took them off, put them on the hood of the car, put them in the car seat, buckled it up, gave him his cars that he likes to play with, and we headed out, pulled out of the driveway, down the street, got on the exit to the interstate, driving, and as soon as I pick up some speed on the interstate, whatever was on my hood flew up, went off the windshield, back in the back of traffic, and I looked and said, well, Shepard, Daddy has no more glasses, right? So I had to get some new ones simply because I was in a hurry. Hurry brings destruction. Hurry brings distraction. And we need to lean into slowing down today. Here's the idea. We say this all the time. There's an enemy in our life, an actual enemy that wants to destroy us. And a very amazing spiritual leader from a long time ago and lived an amazing life named Corey Ten Boom. She says this, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. There may be, you know what, maybe some of us are dealing with some sin in our life that we need to realize we're forgiven and set free. Maybe some of us in our life, we understand we're forgiven and set free. We're just way too busy to enjoy it. We're way too busy to experience it. We are way too busy to invite someone else into it and help someone else. Today's about slowing down. We're not in a rush. We're not in a hurry anymore. We're leaning in to the presence of God, the peace of God rest that he has for us. Come to me and I'll give you rest. Come on, let's pray as we jump into the message this morning. God, I'm so thankful for everybody here. So thankful you brought them here safely. I pray that you would help us leave safely as well. God, I pray that you would just show us who you are. God, you would speak to us about how good a God you are during this time. You would help us slow down and lean in to you today and listen to who you are. God, I pray for everybody in this room. I pray for every, all the kids next door. I pray they would just have an amazing time together. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Come on, let's clap our hands. We're going to have a great day today. Yes. Turn, the car, turn your card over. Write this phrase down for me because it's really what we're kind of talking against today. It's that sin and busyness cut off our connection to God 
to other people, and even to our own soul. Sin and busyness cut off our connection to God, to other people, and even to our own soul. God does not want you to live cut off from himself. We can't survive that way. God doesn't want you to live cut off from other people. We can't survive that way. And God especially does not want you to be cut off from your soul, your spirit, who you are on the inside, what he breathed life into so long ago. And what this book really talks about is that there's now actually like a clinical diagnosis of this thing called hurry sickness. That people are in a hurry so much, so often, that they're now actually sick with it. Hurry sickness. Here are some symptoms or maybe some actions, practicalities of hurry sickness. One of the first actions we do when we're in a hurry is maybe when you're at the grocery store and you're in a longer line, but there's a line a few lines down that's only got a couple people in it, you will leave the line you're in to go to the other line, right? Anybody do that? It's okay, we can be honest, I will definitely raise every hand that I have because that is so me. Like, I'm the person that's become so observant at grocery stores. You know when you, you, it's really busy, and you see like the other attendant that's not, that may be on break or is coming into their shift, and they're walking up to one of the registers, and you're like, oh, they're opening a new register. And so before they even like say, I can take you over here, I'm loading my stuff on the conveyor belt, ready to go. Like, I don't know if you're opening or not, but you're going to because I'm here right now. Like I'm the person speeding over. I'm the guy that loves self-checkout lines because I don't want to wait on anybody. Like, let me do my thing, my own thing. Let me get in and get out. I'm also the guy that when it comes to grocery shopping, I enjoy shopping a little bit more at Walmart than Publix because Publix is too nice, man. When you got the 10 items or less line, they're letting people go through who have like 14 or 15 items. No, the rule says 10 items or less. You go to Walmart, ah, uh-uh, 11 items, even if that 11th item is a candy bar, that person ain't going through that line, and I like that because I'm very strategic on how do I limit my grocery shopping to just the 10 items that I need. Maybe you do this in traffic. You ever get into like just the lane back and forth limbo where it's like this lane's moving a little bit so you'll hop over here and then you get there and now you're stuck and this lane's going and so you're like, sorry, I gotta get over here now. Before you know it, you're like switch changing lanes just to maybe get one car ahead. Hurry sickness knows that yellow does not mean slow down for the red. It means gun it so you don't miss, so you don't catch the red, right? Like we just are in a hurry. But in more a serious sense, sometimes hurry leads to frustration. Sometimes hurry leads to anger. Some, sometimes hurry leads us to missing out on moments that really matter, moments that we need to be present in, moments we need to slow down and experience. Because here's the thing, the problem today is not that we have a lot to do. I want you to write that down. The problem isn't a lot to do. It's t- that we have too much to do. What we're going to see is Jesus had probably the most important, the most influential life that ever existed here on this earth. He did. He was, both, he was the most influential and important person to talk about in all of history. He had a lot to do, but he was never in a hurry. He was never rushed. He never had too much to do. And we're going to see that in a story today. And I want, I want to lean into that a little bit for you. Now, listen, we live lives, man. I, I'm, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor. There's a lot to do, okay? This, this doesn't just, like, happen, you know? Like, like, you get to walk into and experience it, but there's a lot that goes into it. And it, there's a lot to do to make happen, to keep our church alive and, and growing and moving forward. But I need to healthily walk the balance of having a lot to do and having too much to do. Because when I have too much to do, I get stressed out. When I have too much, I get rushed. When I have too much to do, who suffers is not only me, but my wife and my son and our church. And so I need to learn how to slow down. And realize I may have a lot to do, but I can take a deep breath. Let's see how Jesus interacts with this today. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 18, one of my favorite stories and passages of the, of the Bible with an experience that Jesus has with a couple people. Check this out. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. What amazing faith by this guy that we've got to slow down and like look at. The synagogue leader, other books of the Bible tell us his name is Jairus. He walks up to Jesus and says, hey, my daughter is dead, but I know that if you Lay your hands on her, she will come back to life. How amazing faith is that? That he says, if you will just, I know it, she's gone. But if you can come see her, she'll come back. Really powerful. But here's what happens next in the story. It's so important. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. 
She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Now, I want to stay here for a second because I want to unpack what's going on. Because we can read through these four verses and be like, wow, that's really cool. But you got to put yourself in the story. Now, remember, how did this journey start? By Jairus, the synagogue leader, coming up to Jesus and saying, my daughter's dead and I need you to come see her. We've lost everything, but only you can make a difference now, Jesus. Only you can bring her back to life. You gotta come now. Jesus does not, doesn't say he, he sprints off or runs off. He says he simply goes. He went with him. But an interruption happens. A woman who has been, had an issue with blood for years, a woman who has lost everything other again, Books of the Bible tell us that she was a wealthy woman who had been to doctor after doctor after doctor, and after every visit, she left worse than she was before. She left taken advantage of. She was just, the things she was going to were actually making her worse. And she came to this point where she was broken and alone, and she had heard about Jesus, and the only thing she could think of was just getting to him. What this passage doesn't tell you is that Jesus is surrounded by hundreds of people. And so she was weak, she was broken. She had been issued with this sickness for so many years. Probably just taking a step took everything that she had. She did not only have to take a step, she had to fight through a crowd simply to touch Jesus. What great faith, right? And we're like, not you guys, but some people. It's raining, I'm not going to church today, right? Like, she didn't say anything. She said, it doesn't matter. If I can get to Jesus, everything can change. If I can have a moment where I can have an experience with Jesus, everything can change. Now, what happens? Now, you've got to put yourself in this story. Jesus was considered a rabbinical figure at the time. He was very important spiritually. He was seen as an authority figure, and so he was seen as someone who, someone who was unclean, who was someone who suffered with sickness. You did not touch him, and especially if you were a woman, you did not touch him. So this woman climbs her way to Jesus and grabs his cloak. What is Jesus' response? It's not a hurried response of, hey, I got somewhere to be. Leave me alone. It's not how dare you. Verse 22, what does it say? It says, Jesus turned and saw her. Would you underline that for me? Because I, I think a lot of us need to understand that today. Is that when you are in desperation mode, when you're stressed out, when you don't know what else to do, and you come to Jesus, I promise you, because I've seen it in my life, he simply turns around and sees you. He notices you. He sees your pain. He sees your difficulties. He sees what you've walked through. He sees the doubts and questions that you have and helps you and identifies with you and is simply there. He turned and saw her. What does he say? Take heart, daughter. He uses a relational term to her. He said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. See, Jesus doesn't have to be in a rush because when he speaks, when he moves, it happens just like that. We need to understand that just like this woman, sometimes we can spend years and spend resources and finances trying to get things done in the way we feel is comfortable or what we're supposed to do, when at all times it would have just taken a moment with Jesus to be healed, to be set free, to be restored, because it starts there. That's where it starts. That's where God moves, a simple touch from Jesus. Now listen, I'm not condemning earthly things like medicine and counsel. I need that myself. But those things always leave us still in need. The only thing that brings complete and total healing or brings complete and total strength to get through those things is that moment with Jesus. It's great for this woman. Don't forget who's standing observing this interaction. Jairus, who says, hey, um, uh, Jesus, we, we got to go. Do you know, remember what I just told you? My daughter's dead. We have got to go. My need is really important. How are you turning and looking at this woman? The disciples say, later in another, in another passage of scripture, he says, Jesus, what are you talking about? Who touched you? Do you not see all these people, man? Everybody did. Why is that a big deal? Because of one person, one story is important to Jesus. He's never in a rush. He's never in her. I need you to understand, there's a lot of us in here. Jesus is not rushing to solve my problems before he's rushing to solve your problems. He is the end all, be all, alpha and omega. He is exactly what we all need in this moment for each and every single one of us. And he slows down to be in this moment for me and for you. Write this down for me. What we see in this story is that Jesus is patient and present to the moment. 
He doesn't look at Jairus and say, hey, yeah, you're right. We got to go. I'm sorry, lady. He didn't even, look, look, what does it say? It says that she was healed the moment she touched Jesus. But Jesus took the time to be patient and find her. Here's why. See, Jesus, he will answer the prayers in our life of healing for sickness and disease, financial provision. He will answer those prayers. But he knows the deeper need that you have is to know that you can be forgiven and set free and have a relationship with him. Because that's what breathes life into your spirit. That's what saves your soul. He needed this woman to know that, hey, you're a daughter in the family of God. You're not only healed, you're forgiven as well. And you belong here in my presence. And he did that with a simple take heart daughter. He did that simply by being patient and locking eyes with her. But then he's also present to the moment. Let's, let's finish off that verse from Matthew chapter 9. When Jesus entered Jairus' house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, talk about just annoyance right there. Noisy crowd and playing pipes, who wants that in their house? Not me. He said, go away. I love that you just go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. And news of this spread throughout all the region. I mean, very quickly in one verse, Jesus just raised someone from the dead. Let's not overlook that. He may have said she's just sleeping, but at the, I mean, they said she was dead, so we got to believe them with that. But he heals her in this moment. I love that he says, hey, all you guys playing pipes, all you people making noise, get out. I don't get any time for you. Listen. A lot of us need some less noise in our life. And sometimes noise is good. I mean, we like music. We like being around people. But sometimes we got to get rid of the noise so we can have some unhurried one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus where he can be present in the moment and we can be present at that moment. I would hate so many times in my life where I've been too much in a rush to miss a moment where Jesus wanted to use me, where Jesus wanted to speak to me, where he wanted to help me bring encouragement to someone, where he wanted me to let someone know that they're valued, that they're cared for. I could be in a rush. It's so easy to get in a rush, right? It's so easy to get in a hurry. It's so easy to look at all the things that we have to do. One of the things that I love right now is I watch, I watch some shows that are on Disney+. Plus, and one of the things I love about Disney+, Plus, out of all the other streaming networks, one of the things they do is they make you wait for the new episode, right? Like they have new episodes that come out on Friday. You got to wait until next Friday when those come out. And you can't just sit and watch the whole thing. Like sometimes the episodes will end on a cliffhanger. I'm like, oh, I want more. But I got to wait now, right? Like it's, I don't know if you guys remember this, but when I was a kid and there was a show that I enjoyed watching on TV, if it came on like 8 o'clock on a Thursday night, you had to make sure you were there 8 o'clock on a Thursday night because that was before like DVR and you could record things or catch it on on demand. You missed it and you probably couldn't watch it again. So the next day at school, I'm, oh, did you see last night? No, I didn't. I missed it, right? Because it's so easy to miss things and get in a hurry and forget that patience is good and slowing down is good. What we see in the story of Jesus is that he's not in a rush, so neither do we need to be. We do not need to be in a rush. Jesus wasn't in a rush, so neither do we need to be in a rush. It slows down. It doesn't say when he heard the bad news about Jairus' daughter that he took off at a sprint because he went with him a walking pace, because Jesus knows that if he's there, it's okay. Whether he's there after the, good news, after the bad news or before the bad news, it's okay, because he is that good, he is that powerful, he is that strong. And sometimes it's so key just to slow down, to be patient and present in the moment, and to know that Jesus is not in a rush. All the problems you are trying to solve right now, Jesus is not in a rush to solve, because here's the thing, problems are like the greatest promise in life. They're going to happen. <laughs> like, we are going to have problems. And Jesus knows that amidst every problem, you're always going to need a person that you need, you're going to need to turn to, that you're going to need to call on. There's going to need to be a person who can step into that situation and be there for you. And Jesus knows he's the only person that can be that for you. Jesus is the only person in my life who has never let me down. Jesus is the only person in my life that has never done something or spoken something to me or moved in a way that was bad for me later on. Because he said, I don't come to kill and destroy. I've come to give you life and life to the full. The only way you have a full life is to slow down, to not be in a hurry. The only way that we can fully experience this life is to realize that on the seventh day, God rested. Yeah, he worked for six, but on the seventh day, he enjoyed creation. 
Some of us need to lean back a little bit more and enjoy what's going on. It's hard when you have a kid because sometimes you know there's things you need to do. Like, I know I need to go to the gym. I need to, I'm 33 now. I mean, I know my metabolism is going away. So I need to go to the gym. I need to stay healthy. I need to work out. But one of, my, one of the things my son Shepard loves to say is when he sees me in, like, my gym attire, he's like, Daddy, don't go to the gym. Will you just stay here? I'm like, how do I say no to that, man? Like, Shepard, I'm not going to keep up with you if I don't go to the gym, okay? So, like, and it's hard, though. Because I do, I want to do both, but sometimes I realize that Shepard's only going to be three years old once. What I've learned about as a parent is to appreciate time more than I ever have before. Like Shepard was only six months one time, and man, oh man, I miss little baby Shepard because he just laid there, didn't move, had so many little sweet smiles, didn't have to worry about him getting at anything. Now I love three-year-old Shepard too, but he was only six months once. He was only three years old once. Now he's growing, right? And so for us, we only get, like today, we only get one Sunday, April 11th, 2021. In our entire life, we only get one. And so we need to slow down and experience it. You only get these moments maybe one time. Now, God is a redeemer, but he's not a time traveler. So that means that we can't miss out on the moments that he's called us to be patient in and be present in and not be in a hurry in. And you're going to see that in your family and your relationships. And most importantly, you're going to see it in your relationship with God, how important slowing down is and to ruthlessly eliminate this thing we call hurry. Because sometimes we need to realize that that has not put us in a good place. Think about it this way, and we'll begin to close. Um, think about when you've been, you've been the most rushed, the most in a hurry you've ever been. Are you the best version of yourself? Like the most hurtful things I've said as a husband, the most mean things I've said as a dad to shepherd, is always when I'm in a hurry. It's always when I'm running late to work, always when I'm stressed out, because when you're in a hurry, you're short, you're quick, you're not thinking, you're not empathetic to what's going on around you. You are not your best self when you're rushed and in a hurry. When are you when your best self? When you're rested, when you slow down. I read a stat in, in the book, they talk about a stat that before the invention of the light bulb, people averaged like 10 or 11 hours of sleep. I don't even remember the last time I got that much sleep because like right now we're like five to six is good, right? But it was because that the light bulb, we could do things at night. We could see now. But isn't it funny how it actually impacted us maybe in a negative way when it came to our emotional health and our spiritual health? Because back in the day, people just went to bed when the sun went down. And they woke up when the sun went up. Like, oh, that made sense. Can't do anything. It's dark. And I think sometimes we need to look at the hurry level of our life in the same way. Maybe not sun, S-U-N, but sun, S-O-N. Man, it, it, I just want to, you know, if Jesus is resting, I want to rest. I want to slow down. If he's moving, I'm going to move with him. If he's healing, I want to be there. But if he's resting and spending time, just hanging out because that's what he does. That's what I want to do. And we need to get back in the healthy rhythm of life. Let me give you a practice for this week. It's really easy. Two words. Told you already. Slow down. Slow. To, turn to the person next to you as you write it down. Tell them, hey, slow down. Give them an elbow bump. Say it's time to slow down. Sometimes we do need that angry dad out in front of the house to shout, hey, slow down. You're going to hurt somebody. You're going to hurt yourself. Can I give you permission to slow down this week? I want to give you three quick things to pause two to three times during each day this week and practice these things. The first one is to simply breathe. Simply breathe. I want you to write the word Yahweh next to that one. If you're unfamiliar with that word, it's pretty much one of the Hebrew most reverent names they could think of for God. Why did they name God Yahweh? Some scholars believe it's because when you put all those Hebrew letters together, it sounds like breathing. Yahweh. Yahweh. Where did it all start? How did our life start? How did existence start? With the breath of God being breathed into us on the ground. See, I don't know in 10 seconds if your problem can solve, but I know that in 10 seconds I can simply breathe in the name of God and I can breathe out the presence of God into my life. Would you close your eyes with me right now in this moment? I just want to give you permission to do this right now. Close your eyes, just as Paige plays, just listen to that. And I just want to take 10 seconds and I want to breathe in the name of God and breathe out the presence of God. I don't want to think about any problems. I don't want to think about any stressful situations. Don't think about where you're going to lunch after service today. Just be in this moment. Be patient and be present. Would you do this? Do me a favor. Just let's breathe in. Let's breathe out. Let's breathe in. Let's breathe out. 
you open your eyes and look back at me today. I know this week you're gonna find yourself in stressful, hurried situations. I know at some point in life you're gonna find yourself where you don't know what to do next. Can I encourage you in those moments, it's not to get out the solution hat and put it on. It's not to get out the problem solver hat and put it on. It's to slow down and simply breathe. God, I need you. God, I can't do this without you. Yahweh, your name is powerful over every situation. Second thing is this, is, is to walk with God. You know, I've grown up in church a long time, and we used to talk about our faith journey as it was our walk with God, not our run with God, not our race with God, but our walk. In the book, he talks about a Japanese theologian who wrote this really small kind of pamphlet-sized book called A Three-Mile-An-Hour God. I want you to write that down. And this theologian wrote this book with the thesis simply that three miles an hour is the average walking speed of every single person. To know that that is where God is actually the most interested in your life is to get out and walk with you. To get out and not move at a race pace, to not sprint, to not go quickly, but to slow down and walk with you. Can I encourage you after you simply breathe this week to find time during your work day or at home Go outside and simply walk around the block. Walk around the building. Don't put your headphones in. Don't think about anything else. Just walk with God and imagine he's walking right there with you. And just walk. Take in creation. Listen to the sounds of creation. And and just listen to the voice of God speaking to you. Because if you make space for God to speak to you, he will. And it's okay if it's at three miles an hour. I mean, if someone was driving three miles an hour in front of me, I would pass them yesterday. But sometimes that's the best speed to live life. God, I'm just walking with you. The third one is this, is to practice gratitude. And I thing I wrote down here was three thankful things. Three thankful things. What I would encourage you to do every day this week, it's pretty simple, but take three minutes. Get out your phone or a piece of paper and simply write three things you're thankful for. Again, one of the easiest practices they've said that can help against anxiety and stress and depression and anger and fear in our life is to remember what we actually have, is to be thankful for the things in our life. God, I'm thankful that I can breathe today. I'm thankful that I have a home to go home to. God, I'm thankful that I'm not going to go hungry today. God, I'm thankful that you're with me. I'm thankful for the prayers that you've answered. God, I'm thankful that over this past year when so many people lost a family member or a friend during this pandemic, I'm thankful that you protected our family. God, I'm thankful that you're with us. I'm thankful that no matter what, God, you've always been there for me. God, I'm thankful that I get to have lunch with a friend I haven't seen this week. I'm thankful that you're with me and there for me no matter what. Take time to be thankful and write it down. Before you know it, you'll realize, man, God has been good to me. God has been there for me. Because here's the thing. God wants you to enjoy life. As we close today, I want you, I want to leave you with that. God wants you to enjoy your life. He would not create you as his son and daughter to lift to live a weary and burdened boring life. He wants you to enjoy it. He wants you to open up and experience it. He wants you to realize that he is proud of you, that he's placed purpose in you, that the best is yet to come each and every day in your life. And he simply says, let's enjoy this thing. Let's live it together. Let's not hurry and worry about tomorrow. Let's be present today. Here's a very simple example for you. Coke slogan, enjoy, right? Now I want you to open up and enjoy life, but here's the thing that we do. God gives us this gift of a life we can enjoy, and then our natural reaction is to start to get in a hurry, to figure out all the things that we have to do, to be awake with the arguments that we've had in our family, to focus on all the things we gotta do at work this week. We got a meeting with our boss this week, we don't know what it's about, and we're super scared about it. We gotta make sure we post on social media today because we got those followers to impress and that aesthetic to live up to. We got all these financial bills that we don't know how they're gonna pay, and we're just stressed out, we're shaken up, and then we're like, oh, Oh man, I am not opening this thing. And we miss out on the enjoyment of life that God has for us now because we're angry, we're afraid, and we know that if we open this thing, Pastor Ryan's going to have to get a new shirt because he's going to be drenched in all the hurry that we've experienced. But what about when we slow down, rest in God's presence, hang out in the fridge where we can get cold like we're supposed to? We slow down, we don't shake ourselves up, we just slow down and experience and trust that God's with us. Now, I don't drink a lot of soda anymore, but I still love this sound right here. 
hand. That's just nice. That's nice. And that's what God wants for you. Way more than just an enjoyment from a Coke. We're going to give you a free can of Coke as you leave today, because why not? But he wants you to have that satisfying sound in your life. When you open up and experience him, when you say yes to him, when you invite him in, when you slow down, (sighs) enjoy. It's who you are. As we move through these talks, I want you to be free from stress and free from hurry. And I want you to rest in the presence of Jesus. Can I pray and speak this verse over you today as we close? Come on, let's turn our attention to the screen. Matthew 11, 28, verse through 30, again, the message version. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Come on, let's underline that phrase today. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Stay with Jesus. Slow down. Be present in the moment and you'll live free. You'll live light. You'll live encouraged and strong, and I promise you, you will enjoy the life that you have, the gift of God that you have every single day, more than ever. Come to me, come to Jesus, and I'll give you rest.